Hello, and welcome to USA Today's The Excerpt. I'm Dana Taylor. Living, working, even vacationing off world is no longer a distant concept. We're approaching a time when humans aren't just visitors to outer space, but could become residents. With the International Space Station set to retire by the end of 2030, private companies are racing to replace it. As space travel and space mining move from science fiction to becoming everyday realities, how do we balance access, ambition, and accountability in the next space race? Joining me now to discuss those topics and more is Namrata Kaswami, Professor of Space Security at Johns Hopkins University. Thanks for joining me, Namrata. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, it's a real pleasure. Uh, before we continue, uh, I have to give a disclaimer. Everything I say today is my own perspective and does not represent the perspective of the U.S. Space Force, the Air Force, or the Department of Defense. What can you share with us regarding some of the private stations currently being worked on to inhabit low Earth orbit? There are actually several private stations that are being built uh, to inhabit low Earth orbit. One is, of course, Oxium Space that is building a private space station under NASA's commercial low Earth orbit destinations. And so uh, that is going to be functional between the year 2028 and 2030, especially because the International Space Station uh, that is up there is going to be deorbited by 2030. Blue Origin also wants to build uh, space stations in low Earth orbit. But what is interesting uh, is that there are space stations that are being built across the world. One is, of course, by China. India is also wanting to build that. And so uh, the most important thing is that these space stations are about extending, as you mentioned, human habitation in low Earth orbit. And so by 2030, we'll have quite a few commercially. With ISS being decommissioned, how might the shift to private space stations impact the sort of collaborative scientific research that's been one of the International Space Station's hallmarks? In some sense, it'll be a continuation because if you uh, listen to NASA's uh, contract as well as guidelines for commercial uh, lunar destinations as a policy on it, uh, the guideline is clear that while this is going to be commercial, international partnerships will still remain a key and nations that are partners and allies of the U.S. will be able to continue uh, con conducting their scientific experiment. In fact, this year uh, there are Indian astronauts that are training to become a part of Oxium Space commercial, uh, you know, flight to the International Space Station. So that's the kind of continuity we will see with commercial lunar destination, uh, low Earth orbit destinations as well. Namara, do you see private space stations as a necessary step in democratizing access to space? Or is there a danger that space will become an exclusive playground for the ultra wealthy? So that's a question that we grapple with a lot, right? So with commercialization of, say, uh, low Earth orbit destinations, it could be that they would become much more expensive. And one of the philosophy of the International Space Station was that it would make access to low Earth orbit much more cheaper, which means it will result in democratization, right? So in my research, what I notice is that while there is a concern that because there are these billionaires and private companies building this capability, that the price tag will go up. But what I see is that actually because of the low cost of launch, which is a vital part of building space stations in low Earth orbit, I would argue that we will actually see much more democratization because of the fact that many more of us, including those from the developing world, will be able to access this particular capability. So I actually see a, a effect that democratization will continue. Sticking with that, with companies like Blue Origin and SpaceX developing their own space stations and rockets, do you see the new space race as a competition between countries, billionaires, perhaps both? In the post-Cold War period, where we see an exponential rise of the private space sector, not just in the U.S., but internationally, China has since 2014 established policy to support the commercial space sector. So has India in 2023. I would point out that while there is this thinking that because there are billionaires investing in space capability, like say with 
SpaceX and Blue Origin and Virgin uh, with Richard Branson, that there would be a competition with states on one side and the companies that are supported by billionaires on the other. But because of the fact that all these companies have to register with a particular nation, because of outer space treaty obligations, because uh, states are responsible for their behavior, including licensing launch, I would say that what I notice as a trend is that the commercial companies are actually supporting state capability to build uh, the ability to commercially invest across different uh, sectors in space, be it low Earth orbit, the moon and beyond. So I would argue that it will be still states competing and commercial companies adding to the strategic advantage of those states. Are there any concerns that NASA and other national space agencies are going to lose their influence as private space stations come online? Are these partnerships the beginning of the end of public space programs? The concern is valid because across different sectors, be it launch, be it uh, low Earth orbit space stations, that uh, commercialization might result in uh, public companies like NASA supported by the state losing their influence. But actually what is so interesting, and I would love your audience to know this, is that while it appears that uh, commercial companies are going to take over, say, low Earth orbit space station building, maintenance, including launch, they are all under what is known as NASA's low Earth orbit destination policy. So the policy, the licensing, some of the funding continues to come from the state. So what is most important to realize is that the very fact that we are having commercial companies go to low Earth orbit to build space station capability is being supported by the U.S. across different policy uh, bodies like the White House, Congress, as well as NASA. So their influence will continue. They will continue to shape why this is important and why this needs to be built. And commercial companies basically are a part of that larger policy ecosystem. So I do not see, for example, NASA's influence, especially when it comes to implementation of a policy, being reduced. Help me understand how low Earth orbit is regulated. Are there treaties in place? Should it be regulated like international waters? So we have several treaties that actually regulate space activity. One is, of course, the Outer Space Treaty of 1967. Then we have Registration Convention, Liability Convention. So when states are members and almost all spacefaring nations, including the United States, is a member of the Outer Space Treaty. So by degree and by treaty obligation, states regulate activity in low Earth orbit, which includes launch to low Earth orbit, how satellites are maintained, the deorbiting plan. So everything has to be regulated. The only place where concern still exists is that unlike geosynchronous orbit that starts about 36,000 kilometers above Earth, low Earth orbit is from 100 kilometers to about 36,000 kilometers. So we still do not have the kind of international regulation like the International Telecommunication Union does for geosynchronous orbit. By that, what I mean is that there are certain strategic spectrum bands that are vital and the ITU regulates that. Low Earth orbit does not have that kind of regulation yet because when these treaties were established, I don't think they envisioned this kind of exponential rise of commercial space activity. So, but I'll end by saying that because that has been recognized as a concern, there are conversations ongoing at the Committee for the Peaceful Use of Outer Space, including the ITU, that are trying to build that kind of regulatory structures uh, going forward. We do not have that yet, but because it has been recognized now as a lacune, they are trying to build it. There are high stakes involved in the current space race that go beyond space tourism, efforts to mine resources from the moon, asteroids and beyond are also at play here. Who could or even should profit from these materials? That's a great question to ask because one of my book, uh, Scramble for the Skies, the Great Power Competition to Control the Resources of Outer Space is all about that. So. 
uh, as I mentioned before, even when you think about, say, space resources, space mining that you mentioned, there are certain resources that are vital. One is helium-3 that is found in large quantity on the moon, especially the south pole of the moon. And that is vital for, say, uh, capability like nuclear fusion. Then we have water ice that can be turned into fuel, oxygen. So then the question is, who can profit from this? I would argue that because we are starting to see a rise in uh, investment for space resource utilization, you would think that states will still profit. There will be regulatory mechanisms that would enable some level of sharing and also because of outer space treaty obligations. So on one hand, when you think about commercial investment, companies really want to profit from what they invest in, right? So there has to be some level of guarantee that the money they put in, there is a return. But then there is also the obligation that tells you that, well, if you take resources from the moon, there has to be some capability to share it with your partners. And that is being worked out, for example, in the Artemis Accords that the US has instituted. And China has uh, started one, a different kind of approach, which is called the International Lunar Research Station uh, Charter, and they also talk about how can we share it. We are not there yet, but to answer your question, it will be the states that will profit, but private sector would want to have clarity on what they can profit as well. Is it clear when space mining could become commercially viable? And then how do you see it potentially impacting global power dynamics on Earth? In my research, uh, looking at different states, which includes the US, China, Luxembourg, United Arab Emirates, Russia, Japan, I would argue that if I look at China's plan, space mining could become a reality commercially by 2040. So by 2036, China wants to establish a research uh, station on the moon. And that kind of capability is going to give a return uh, of investment between the years 2036 and 2040. What role should smaller nations play here in shaping the international space agenda? In response to the earlier question you asked, and with continuing with this, how does this affect, for example, power projection? And what do small nations uh, play? So I would argue that when you think about, say, a nation that has that strategic advantage, for example, in establishing a presence on the moon, which means that nation has a advantage getting even more capable in terms of deep, deep space mission. So that has a deep impact on the power dynamics. One, because of your ability to look down, for example, with say communication capability, space situational awareness capability, for example, on the moon, which means that you can actually see what is in low earth orbit. And by extension, you can then understand for example, what U.S. capability in low Earth orbit is doing for military power projection, right? So there is a deep impact on how that will play out on Earth. Now, small nations, what they're doing is very interesting. So they are basically playing a very critical role at the level of the United Nations. For example, as I mentioned, the International Telecommunication Union, the Committee for the Peaceful Use of Outer Space, in ensuring that the rules of space commerce, space resource utilization are being built today so that middle and small nations can take advantage one day when this is this becomes a reality. So they have a role in framing the norms, the legal mechanisms, as well as informing the behavior of the major powers. Finally, as humans look to expand beyond Earth, what are your thoughts regarding the kind of future we're laying the groundwork for now and who gets to decide? The groundwork to actually build the kind of future we are hearing, one is that we are able to expand human civilization beyond Earth, which would require what we discussed in our first, uh, when we first started this podcast, which is that we will be absolutely required to be able to sustain humans in low Earth orbit beyond just say in the International Space Station or the Tiangong Space Station. We'll have to build extended structures. Second, we will have to be able to sustain humans, say, on the moon, which we haven't done as yet. We have been to the moon, but we have returned humans very quickly. The idea is to sustain human settlement as well as, say, mining extraction for several years, right? So those are the challenges. And the final challenge is that today, the infrastructure for communication, for time zone, it's vital to build 
time zones that are relevant to those celestial bodies. So the U.S., China are investing in, say, a concept called LunaNet for the moon, uh, which is a lunar-based internet and time zone. The moon has a different uh, cycle than Earth. And then finally for Mars. So those are the requirements. And then the final requirement is that once you extract the resources, which are, say, platinum group metals that are worth millions of dollars today, uh, we will have to find a way to build them into actual sustainable infrastructure. So that's a challenge that has to be cracked, say, in the next 10 years to think about the kind of future we are talking about, which is human settlement beyond uh, low Earth orbit or Earth. Namrata, thank you so much for being on the excerpt. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's a real honor. Thanks for watching. I'm Dana Taylor. I'll see you next time.